the previous lecture we considered uh, uh, the modeling of earthquake ground accelerations uh, at any point in terms of three components uh, and we saw that uh, there exist three axes along which the three components can be approximated as being uh, uncorrelated and that facilitates the formulation of the problem. We also briefly saw uh, some issues associated with spatial variability of earthquake ground motions and we um, summarized the major phenomenological features that are associated with spatial variability of earthquake ground motions. So as I mentioned, uh, the data for making such models have become available since 1980s where dense strong motion seismic arrays have been established at a few places on the earth's crust. One of that is in Taiwan and in a region of radius of about 2 kilometers, there are about 30 strong motion accelerograms distributed along 3 concentric circles and it, this array has recorded a few events and that data has formed the basis for developing uh, models for strong ground motion uh, which takes into account uh, spatial variability features. So we are discussing in this part of uh, the lecture, uh, we, our focus will be on land based structures. There are multiply supported uh, structures like piping in uh, industrial complexes where the piping structures are supported on the primary system at different uh, say points along the height and in the event of an earthquake, this piping structures are again subjected to differential support motions. We will briefly touch upon this problem, but our discussion will be mainly focused on land based structures like uh, bridges, uh, dams and so on and so forth. For this class of problems, it has been found through studies in the existing literature that the assumption of uniform support motion is not guaranteed to provide conservative estimates of the response. It could be conservative or it may not be conservative. Now in the last lecture, we also saw why spatial variability occurs and we considered uh, four different effects. The first one was wave passage effect where a wave front reaches to recording stations at different times because the angle, um, the incident uh, in the plane, the wave front is inclined to the uh, plane of the ground. That leads to delays in arrival times. And the other one was the extended source effect because energy gets released along a fault line, uh, the uh, source of energy is an extended line and consequently the energy is released in packets along this line at different time instants and the effect of that is felt at stations 1 and 2 at different times and this effect is known as extended source effect. And the waves propagate through inhomogeneous medium, they will be scattered and that also induces certain uh, variability in the ground accelerations. And attenuation effect refers to the uh, decay of the waves as they travel through the earth's medium and if the distance between, uh, distance through which the waves travel changes, the attenuation effect also uh, changes and this uh, perhaps is not that very important for land based engineering structures. Um, uh, so this effect is not that crucial compared to the other three effects. So the question that we wish to ask now is what are the phenomenological features associated with response of structures subjected to spatially varying ground motions? When is it important to consider these effects and how to model spatially varying ground motions as random processes and how to develop these models based on data and based on phenomenological considerations and how to develop model combination rules when the inputs are specified in terms of a set of response spectra. Let us see. Uh, consider some of these questions. Now if we consider a structure, engineering structure schematically shown here, the, this structure has three supports and is subjected to uh, say it is a planar structure. So there are six components of ground motion UG1, UG2, uh, UG3, UG4, UG5, UG6. Now we can model these six components as a vector random process and our objective is to characterize uh, the response of the structure when these six components are uh, mutually correlated random processes. 
Now, we can quickly recall how do we describe two random processes. Suppose we have random processes u of t and v of t, we can define their covariance matrix uh, is given by C u u of t 1 comma t 2, C u v of t 1 comma t 2 and so on and so forth. And if process is stationary, we get uh, this as C u u tau, C u u v tau, C v u tau and C v v tau and C u v of tau is given by u of t into v of t plus tau. This is same as v of t plus tau into u of t. Therefore, C u v of tau is C v u of minus tau. The associated power spectral density function matrix uh, has diagonal terms which are the auto power spectral density functions and the cross terms which are the cross power spectral density functions. The auto power spectral density functions are real valued whereas the cross power spectral density functions are complex valued and uh, the definitions are shown here. This we have discussed in some of the earlier lectures and the power spectral density function has certain properties like S u v of minus omega is same as S v u of omega and S u v conjugate of omega is S u v of minus omega. So, this is the definition of the relationship between cross power spectral density function and cross correlation function or the cross covariance function. We write the cross power spectral density function in terms of an amplitude and a phase and this quantity is the amplitude of cross PSD function and this phi is the phase spectrum. We call <coughs> the real part S u v of omega can also be expressed in terms of real and imaginary parts. The real part is called cospectrum and the imaginary part is called quadrature spectrum. So, we have amplitude and phase, cospectrum and quadrature spectrum. We define a quantity known as complex coherency function which is the ratio of the cross power spectral density function to the square root of S u u of omega into S v v of omega. The, here it is assumed that the denominator is not 0. If denominator is 0, this coherence function is taken to be 0. This itself is a complex valued function and we can write this again in terms of an amplitude and a phase and uh, this quantity, the amplitude is known as coherency function. So, that is the ratio of modulus of S u v of omega to square root of S u u into S v v of omega. We can show that the coherency function is bounded between 0 and 1 and uh, if coherence function is 0, it uh, implies lack of linear dependency between two processes and if two processes are linearly related, the coherency function is 1. Now, if we consider now for purpose of discussion two points on the ground surface and we want to model the ground accelerations at these two points as pair of random processes. There are two components, we have already seen how to model the individual components through their auto power spectral density functions. So, our basic objective would be to model the cross power spectral density function that essentially boils down to modeling of the coherency function. So, uh, we will focus on modeling the coherency function. The coherency function captures the spatial variability characteristics. Now, I am going to discuss a semi empirical model to start with uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Kurugan. Uh, he assumes, uh, I mean he considers uh, four sources of phenomena that lead to spatial variability and in according to him, the first effect is known as incoherency effect. This is caused due to scattering in heterogeneous medium and differential superpositioning of waves arriving from an extended source. The next one is wave passage effect which causes time delays and the attenuation effect and the site response effect. Now, if we consider two stations K and L and the ground accelerations A k of t and A l of t that is A k of t is the ground acceleration at station k, A l of t is ground acceleration at station L. We will model these two random processes as having 0 mean and stationary Gaussian random process. The coherency function is given by uh, ratio of the cross power spectral density function. Here I am using capital G to denote the power spectral density function. G A k A l of omega divided by square root of G A k A k of omega G A l A l omega. So, this is when the denominator is not equal to 0, it is 0 when denominator is 0. The amplitude of coherency function 
uh, this is again a complex function. So, I can define its amplitude and phase. The amplitude is modulus of gamma k l omega and we introduce a phase theta k l of omega which is related to real and imaginary parts of coherency function through this relation. Our objective in modeling would be to arrive at models for the coherency function. Now, we will digress slightly. Uh, this is something that we already seen, but we will quickly recall. Suppose I write a, uh, a of t is a random process and I write it as i equal to 1 to n a i cos omega i t phi i. These a i's are taken to be normal with 0 mean and variance sigma i square and a i and a j are independent for every i not equal to j and this phi i are taken to be i i d sequence of random variables distributed uniformly in 0 to 2 pi and this phi i and a j are taken to be independent. So, under these assumptions we can show that uh, the expected value of a of t would be 0 and the covariance of a of t will be given by uh, this uh, function. So, this is a mean square periodic uh, random process and its Fourier transform is given by this. It is a sequence of Dirac delta functions stationed at omega i's. Now, this power spectral density function itself can be taken to be a discrete approximation to a continuous power spectral density which is given here. Uh, therefore, uh, a of t can be taken to be an approximation uh, uh, this representation can be taken to be a approximation for generating samples from this power spectral density. Now, we will return to the discussion on ground accelerations. We will consider two stations k and l and the ground acceleration a k of t and l of t. At a k of t, I will write the representation as i equal to 1 to n a i f k omega i r k cos omega i t plus phi i and at a l of t, this way will now get modified due to the four effects that I mentioned. I am not going to get into the physics of those arguments, but I just would like to highlight the nature of the model. Now, this amplitude now gets modified. It is no longer a i, but it is some p k l i a i plus q k l i b i. And this function, I will explain what are these f k and f l, they are different. And this cos omega i t, now there is a time delay t minus tau k l. K l is a uh, refers to stations k, l, k and l and i uh, subscript indicates that these time delays are functions of frequencies. Now, this phase also gets modified by an additional random term. So, now a i, a b are random variables, a i is independent of uh, b j uh, for all i and j, a i is independent of a j for all i not equal to j, b i is uncorrelated with b j for i not equal to j, they have 0 mean, their variances are equal and phi i is are i i d's and epsilon k l i are i i d's and phi i is independent of epsilon, independent of a r and b. So, these all these random variables are mutually independent. This tau k l which is appearing here is arrival time delay for the ith component from station k to l. This p k l and q k l are deterministic constants which are uh, which need to satisfy this condition and they are represented in terms of uh, sin and cosine functions having these angles beta k l comma i. This r m where does it appear? Uh, they, it appears uh, that is r k and r l for m equal to k and l, they appear here. They are source to side distances and this f k that is sitting here is the attenuation law from source to the side. Now, if this representation is um, taken to be acceptable, it is constructed based on various arguments. I have summarized it here, uh, the salient features. If we accept this, as a model, then we can show that the coherency function associated with this model is given by this expression. There is uh, two components in the phase, one is due to phase uh, wave passage, other one is due to site response. This is the time delay actually due to wave passage effect and this is due to the wave propagation in the local soil conditions. This d k l is a distance between sites k and l, d k l of l uh, which appears in the definition of wave passage effect here is the projection of d k l along the direction of wave propagation. 
nu app is apparent shear wave velocity. This h there which are appearing here are the transfer functions from bedrock to the ground surface. This is like Kanai Tajimi transfer functions. So, this is a model for coherency function. This is based on uh, as I said it is a somewhat semi empirical different effects uh, that we expect in modeling ground accelerations uh, are explicitly identified and a model is constructed deliberately to allow for these effects. The model parameters here like this um, beta k l etcetera are to be now calibrated against instrumented records and they need to be identified if you have to use this model. There are actually in the existing literature models which have been directly made from the observed random fields that is purely data based models. Now some of the questions that are considered uh, in uh, analyzing these data uh, are the following. Are the random fields isotropic that is does the covariance between two stations depend upon the separation distance and not on the direction that means any direction you take in the uh, domain of interest as long as you are taking a two stations which are at the same distance separated by same distance their covariance will be the same then the random field is taken to be isotropic. But given the way the wave seismic waves propagate uh, there is a directionality effect and uh, these fields may not be isotropic. Then at any point within the domain the excitations are having three translation components. So at different points you can identify principal axis for excitation at different points. But given that the wave front is propagating roughly in the same direction for the entire region one could assume that the principal axis for uh, the three translation components at different points have the same principal axis I mean they have the same principal axis that is another assumption that we can make. So based on this several authors have suggested uh, you know models uh, and I will just run through some of them. Uh, one of this model is one dimensional isotropic models where the amplitude of coherency function is given as exponential minus a omega into xi where xi is the uh, distance between the sites. Uh, there are various forms of this exponent that are suggested and uh, for instance uh, a directionality uh, this is uh, isotropic and then subsequently there is a model where directionality effect is introduced by considering this angle theta which is the angle between direction of wave propagation and line joining the sites. Now typical values for these model parameters like a1, b1, a2, b2 etc. when psi is measured in kilometers are uh, shown here. Uh, this is just for illustration uh, on the, and these numbers are arrived based on from actual in, uh, instrumentally recorded data. This is Hari Chandran and Van Marke model has this expression a exponential and this exponent plus 1 minus a exponential another exponent. Now this uh, nu of f a, a, uh, has this functional form b has this uh, functional form and these are some of the constant that are uh, obtained for one event from the uh, Taiwan smart array data. So there are other models uh, for example Havo and others models where uh, these are anisotropic uh, random field models where psi1 and psi2 are actually the projected distance of the station separation vector along the normal to the direction of wave propagation. So there are uh, various model parameters here and some, some typical numbers I have included for um, illustration. So this is at another model for short distances when separation distance is less than 100 meters there is another model. Uh, so these are all empirical models which are fitted to observed data. Now the point that uh, we can conclude at this stage is based on data or based on uh, combination of data and certain um, phenomenological arguments we can construct the coherency models for the spatial variability characteristics of ground acceleration. So once, once we reach that conclusion the next question that we need to consider is uh, how do we model the structural behavior under differential support motions especially when 
the support motions are modeled as a vector of uh, random processes. So this is a uh, graph that uh, view, uh, view graph that we saw a while before and the associated governing equations um, uh, can be written. This we have seen earlier in uh, our discussions. The superscript capital T indicates total displacement, absolute displacement and there are n uh, nodes uh, the size of ut is n and ug is the ground degrees of freedom and that is the applied ground displacements, velocities and accelerations. So the structural matrices are partitioned uh, as per this partitioning of the uh, nodal displacements and uh, what are unknown here are uh, this ut, ug double dot is given uh, and pg of t is the reaction transfer to the supports. So we have uh, the size of this uh, ug is I think m cross ng cross 1. So there is n plus ng number of equations with capital N number of unknowns which are u t and uh, ng number of unknowns which are the reactions. So we can write two sets of equation one for the displacement other for the reactions. So that is what uh, we, we should be able to do here. Now in analyzing uh, multiply supported structures and under differential support motions we have already seen that there is what is known as pseudo dynamic response component. That means uh, without the inertial and dissipation effects coming into play there will be uh, stresses in the structure due to the differential support motions and that is known as pseudo dynamic response and that we obtain by considering the uh, equation by omitting the inertial and dissipation uh, effects and we get this equation. We call this response as UP and we can solve for UP uh, in terms of applied support displacements and we call this matrix minus K inverse KG as capital gamma and this is called influence matrix. Now based on that the reaction transfer due to pseudo dynamic action can also be evaluated. If UG of T is a random process we can evaluate properties of UP by using uh, this is a uh, linear transformations on say for example Gaussian random processes we can characterize UP. Now what we do is we write the total response to be the sum of pseudo dynamic response plus the dynamic response. That would mean we will write uh, the displacement vector UT UG as UP UG plus U and 0 and once you substitute into this governing equation and take into account the fact that UP satisfies certain equilibrium equations we can show that the equation governing the dynamic component has this form mu double dot plus u dot plus ku is equal to an effective force t where this effective force is given by uh, this expression. And most often we assume that the effect due to the inertial effect due to the ground acceleration uh, is far exceeds the effect due to the dissipation characteristics and this second set of terms is often ignored. <clears throat> now uh, under various conditions either by uh, actually if uh, mass matrix is diagonal uh, mg would be 0 and if C is proportional to uh, stiffness matrix we can show that the effective force is exactly uh, given by this. But in, in, in other situation also uh, we gen generally assume that the uh, effect of inertial actions uh, predominates and we ignore the terms that involve damping on the right hand side. Now how do we perform random vibration analysis for this uh, problem? Now this is reasonably straightforward. We have discussed this already. Uh, we, we need the uh, power spectral density function between uh, of the ground displacement and for this effective force and P of t is given in terms of ug double dot and ug dot and we write the Fourier transform of this and the conjugate of this multiply and take expectation etc. That is this as shown here and we get uh, the effective uh, power spectral density of the effective force as shown here and once we get that the power spectral density function of the displacement vector can be used in terms can be determined in terms of the matrix of system transfer functions where h of omega is. Uh, minus omega square m plus i omega c plus k inverse that itself can also be expressed in terms of normal mode. So all these we have seen in one of the earlier lectures. 
Now, pseudo dynamic response can be determined using this uh, and the power spectral density of that can be uh, found out in terms of the influence matrix. Here of course, we need the power spectral density of the displacement. The total response is in terms of pseudo dynamic component and dynamic component and again the power spectral density function of the total response can also be derived by manipulating these expressions and we get this to be the power spectral density of the uh, total response. The variance of the response can be found out now after by integrating our frequency domain. This has a variance due to pseudo dynamic component, variance due to dynamic component and contributions due to correlation between pseudo dynamic and dynamic responses. So, these are the characteristic features associated with structures subjected to differential support motions. Now, So, at this stage what we have done is we have outlined how random process models can be made for spatially varying ground motions and how we can formulate the equations of motion. If we assume that inputs are stationary, we can perform analysis in frequency domain and uh, we can get the power spectral density function of the response quantities of interest. The response here consists of a pseudo dynamic component. Uh, dynamic component and some of that is a total uh, response. Now, we will consider the question how to determine the response if the inputs are specified not in terms of power spectral density functions, but in terms of response spectra and coherency functions. If that information is given to us, how to use that and get the highest responses as is implied in the use of response spectrum based methods. So, here we consider the equation of motion in a slightly uh, different notation. So, we call by x the total displacement, u as the support displacements. The form of the equation is quite similar to what I discussed just now. Uh, this form uh, conforms to the one that is used by Dirk Rugan and Ewan Hoffer in uh, the paper in earthquake engineering and structural dynamics. So, this, these are the various sizes of these matrices. Again, we partition the nodal uh, displacement vector into x and u and that induces a partition on the structural matrices of uh, stiffness, mass, etc. And here unknowns are x and this reaction f of t. We decompose the total response into pseudo dynamic response and dynamic response and pseudo dynamic response we obtain by solving the static part of the equation uh, involving only the stiffness terms and we get Excess as r into u, where u is a support displacement. Then we substitute that into the governing equation, this equation into that, and obtain the equation for the uh, uh, the dynamic component. So this we approximate. Uh, we ignore the terms involving damping on the right hand side. And this is now in a form that we can apply the model decomposition method to analyze the problem. So, the response is represented phi into y, where phi is the matrix of eigenvectors. So, uh, phi transpose m phi is taken to be diagonal, and phi transpose k phi is this diagonal, and phi transpose c phi transpose c phi is again diagonal. So, based on that we get now uh, an equation for the generalized coordinates, i th generalized coordinate uh, y i double dot plus 2 eta i omega i y i dot plus omega i square y i. On the right hand side we get uh, contributions to due to the m distinct support motions. So, each mode has uh, each mode responds to each of the sub components of the support uh, accelerations and beta k i is the participation factor for the ith mode corresponding to the kth element in the support displacement vector. So, we get to simplify this uh, discussion what we do is we define a quantity known as s k i which is uh, defined here where it is response of ith uh, uh, a quantity associated with ith mode to the kth component of support acceleration without that participation factor. So, if this is accepted then y i of t can be written as k equal to 1 to m b k i s i of t. 
Now, if z of t is response quantity of interest, which I write it as q transpose into x of t, that is q transpose into xs plus xd. This again, as I said, it could be interest story drift or reaction and so on and so forth. I can write for z of t uh, an expression that is shown here. Uh, there is a summation over support displacements. This is a pseudo dynamic response. This is a dynamic response. Uh, the pseudo dynamic pseudo dynamic response has only static uh, contributions uh, from static behavior, but from m components of the support displacements. The dynamic component has contributions from uh, n generalized coordinates and m support displacement component. So, there is a double summation. Now, we can now, uh, this is a generic form, we can relate this a k and b k i to the various quantities that we have introduced that is uh, made explicit here. Now, the power spectral density function of z of t can now be derived and um, here there will be terms involving only pseudo dynamic component, only dynamic component and cross correlation between dynamic and pseudo dynamic components. So, I have the first term which is a double summation on uh, pseudo corresponding to the pseudo dynamic component. The third term is the contribution from dynamic component as a single summation become double summation because power spectral density function is a second order property and a double summation becomes a quadruple summation and the cross correlation is a triple summation. This is reasonably straightforward. Uh, this h of omega is the transfer function for the ith generalized coordinate. Now, area under this function is my variance. Okay. Now, this variance itself is written in terms of variance of uh, the generalized coordinates and this quantity s k i of t that we have introduced. This h i of omega is as shown here. So, this is a straightforward random aversion analysis made explicit for individual components and for a generic response quantity. Now, I can normalize uh, the uh, cross correlation or cross co coherence terms with respect to standard deviations. I introduce uh, non dimensional quantities rho u k u l, rho u k s l j, rho s k i s l j, where s k i and s l j are uh, just to emphasize our response of these uh, two single degree freedom systems. So, these are non dimensional. Now, I talk about the coherency function. So, for purpose of discussion, we can take the coherency function to be given by this. To apply the method that we are going to discuss, we need to have a model for coherency function. Um, from this, we can get the model for, see if we uh, look at the expressions that we are interested in uh, computing, we need the cross power spectral density function between displacement components at k and l the cross PSD between displacement component at k and acceleration at l and of course, the cross PSD between acceleration at k and acceleration l, k and l are the stations or the components in excitations. So, I need from the, uh, this is coherency model for accelerations. So, from this I have to derive the uh, models for uh, displacement and acceleration and displacements alone and this we use the standard definition of our spectral density function. We divide by minus uh, omega square and omega to the power of 4 to get the required functions as shown here. And the auto power spectral density function itself is taken to be the Clough and Penzine type of uh, power spectral density function. It could be anything else that uh, uh, we are ready to use. So, based on this, the quantities, these non-dimensional quantities uh, can now be evaluated this ok. So, uh, everything that we need to know, evaluate these three quantities are now known. So, that completes our random aversion analysis. Now, let us consider the question of response spectrum uh, based method, how to uh, how to analyze the response when inputs are specified in terms of individual response spectra and the coherency function. Now, we will quickly recall the response spectrum definitions and the limiting behavior. Uh, if you are considering the acceleration u k double dot of t and uh, we consider the response of an oscillator with natural frequency eta i and omega i, the relative displacement uh, response spectrum for relative displacement is given here which, which we interpret as 
uh, expected value of maximum of SKI of t over time t. Uh, this uh, as I think th this limit this uh, response spectrum as omega k goes to 0 we have shown that this is uh, uk max and the pseudo acceleration response spectrum as omega k becomes very large we have shown that this is equivalent to uk double dot max this is known as the peak ground acceleration or the zpa etc these are the limiting behaviors this is the definition of response spectrum now, we introduce what are known as peak factors. For example, the maximum displacement is related to the standard deviation of the displacement through this factor P u k which is the peak factor for displacement. Similarly, the uh, peak factor for response can be written in terms of standard deviation multiplied by the associated peak factor. So, if z of t is the response quantity of interest as has been the case, uh, the peak factor associated with this is given by the standard deviation into peak factor uh, pz. Now, this is the expression sigma z square that we have obtained through uh, standard random regression analysis. Now, I am writing the variances uh, uk, ul. Now, I will write in terms of the peak factors. Uh, if I am interested in expected value of maximum of z of t, that will be pz square into sigma z square uh, and that sigma z square that means on the right hand side I should multiply by sigma z square and for sigma u k I will write it as u k max by p u k sigma uh, s i j for example will be again expressed in, in terms of its associated peak factor. So, in terms of peak factors we get uh, this expression. Now, we make we have seen it uh, we have seen in the earlier discussion that the ratio of uh, pz square by puk pul is approximately unity. This is an assumption anyway we are going to make uh, because peak factors are weakly dependent on frequency and their ratios are nearly unity. If we do that, then the expected value of the maximum z of t is obtained in terms of uh, uk max and the, uh, the response uh, spectrum. Uh, ordinates and the uk max is in fact obtained as limiting uh, value of this uh, response spectra as omega j goes to 0. So, this these are related. So, on the right hand side I have now uh, all the quantities that I know of and this in fact uh, is the desired combination rule. So, this involves uh, the determination of these quantities rows and from the response spectra we have to find out the limiting behavior as omega goes to 0 and obtain uh, these displacement values. So, to be able to use this combination rule it is not enough if only the response spectrum is given for individual components. Uh, there should be an acceptable limiting value for these response spectrum as omega goes to 0 care should be taken to ensure that that is a meaningful limit and also this quantity is rho, rho u k u l, rho u k s i j. Uh, and rho SKI and SLJ has to be evaluated that would require the definition of coherency function. Once all this is in place, we can evaluate this function. So, in summary, we can say that the implementation of this rule requires the knowledge of the PSD compatible response spectrum and knowledge of coherency function. Generalization to include multi component nature of excitation and separation of response into pseudo dynamic and dynamic components could be achieved, although this has not been discussed. And the idea of uh, existence of principal axis for excitation could be assumed, and these axes could be assumed to be the same for all recording stations. So, under this assumption, we can now develop further combination rule where there are multiple components and spatial variability together. So, that has not been done, but that can be uh, done as a straightforward extension. Of course, if you assume that the principal axis are the same for all uh, at all stations. Now, given the lack of adequate knowledge on cross PSD functions of earthquake ground accelerations, uh, it makes sense to ask the questions 
uh, what are the optimal values of these cross PSD functions for which the response reaches their highest values. So this question has been discussed in this paper by Sarkar and Manohar and uh, I will just briefly outline the problem and the solution. So for purpose of discussion we will consider a, a doubly supported single degree freedom system which is subjected to differential support motion x of t and y of t and z t of t is the uh, total displacement. Uh, the total response here is pseudo dynamic response plus dynamic response. So we can write the equation of motion uh, uh, quite straightforward and if we now uh, the pseudo dynamic response can be evaluated by considering only the terms involving stiffness and we get this as a pseudo dynamic response and the dynamic response can be obtained as uh, the difference between the total response and the pseudo dynamic response and we get this as this expression for the problem on hand and the Gauni equations consequently is obtained in this form. Now the input we have two inputs x double dot and y double dot of t we assume that there is 0 mean stationary. Gaussian random processes with power spectral density function given by this 2 by 2 matrix. This cross term that is a cross power spectral density function we write as a modulus and a uh, phase function and e raised to i phi xy can be written as cos phi xy minus i sin phi xy. The response quantity of interest for purpose of discussion we take it to be a force in the left spring and that is given by k by 2 into z t of t minus x of t and that turns out to be uh, this quantity 4 f by k uh, k by 4 into 2 z minus x minus y and we define a quantity g of t uh, which is 4 f by k which is 2 z minus x minus y is something like a displacement quantity of interest. Now let us focus on analyzing this quantity g of t. So to start with we can ask what is PSD of g of t and what is its variance. So this is reasonably straightforward. We get by using the definition of the power spectral density function and the input output relations, we get the power spectral density of SGG of omega to be in this form and the form that is written here is uh, to be noted carefully. Uh, there is one transfer function which multiplies auto PSD at x uh, that is uh, auto power spectral density of x double dot of t, another one that multiplies y double dot of t. And there is a third transfer function which multiplies the amplitude of the cross PSD function. So the terms are, are arranged in this form and it can be shown that this H1, H2 uh, in terms of system natural frequency and damping and uh, parameter omega uh, can be written in this form and this is H3 of omega is in this form where H3 of omega is also a function of the uh, phase spectrum. So, the variance of the quantity of g of t can be written as uh, area under the power spectral density function that has again three components. These three components are different from the three components that we discussed earlier. Earlier what we did was we had a component due to pseudostatic response, a component due to dynamic response and a component due to correlation between pseudostatic and dynamic response. But the way we are writing here is slightly different. We are writing here as variance, contribution to variance due to x double dot of t, contribution to the variance due to y double dot of t and contribution to variance due to correlation between x double dot and y double dot of t. It is in this form it is done therefore h1, h2, h3 have a different meaning here. Now if we rearrange the terms we can write h1, h2 uh, and h3, h1, h2 in this form and if we carefully observe this we can show that h1 and h2 are positive that should be expected given the definition uh, of the quantities and H3 of omega can take both negative or positive values. H3 of omega is written here, uh, this does not lead to any further simplification. So this given the presence of trigonometric terms sin, cosine, etc., there is no uh, guarantee that this is uh, strictly positive or negative, it depends on uh, phi xy of omega whether it is positive or negative. So the question now is. <coughs> we have the variance of the response consisting of three terms. The contribution from the first two terms are positive. The contribution from this term can be either positive or negative for a given omega. Now if SXX and SYY are given, that is the basic assumption we are making, we are assuming that SXY of omega is not available, the knowledge on cross power spectral density function is not available. So we are trying to find out 
that cross power spectral density function which maximizes sigma g square. In absence of any knowledge on spatial variability, what is the worst that might happen is the question. So, what is optimal Sxy of omega which produces the highest variance sigma g square. Now, suppose if we assume that the phase spectrum is given, suppose the distance between two stations is known and the uh, phase is essentially due to time delay, then we can assume that the phase spectrum is available. In that case, if we look at the expression for the variance uh, which I again repeated here, we need to notice that the amplitude of cross power spectral density function is bounded between 0 and this quantity because coherency amplitude of coherency is bounded between minus 0 to 1. Now, for any given value of omega, the contribution to sigma g square from this term, this is unknown, Sxy of omega is unknown. So, what we will do is, we will look at the value of H3. If H3 is negative, we will put Sxy of omega to be 0, that is this limit. On the other hand, if H3 of uh, omega is positive, Sxy omega will assign it to be its maximum possible value. So, this we have to do for every omega. If we do that, then for the th that corresponding uh, Sxy of omega would produce the highest response. If you want the uh, least response, the most favorable excitation, we have to reverse the argument. If H3 is positive, we will put Sxy of omega to be 0 and if it is negative, we will put it to the highest value. So, that the maximum uh, value is deducted from these positive contributions. So, this is the definition of critical uh, say cross power spectral density function when the phase spectrum is available. What is to be noted here that the least favorable and the most favorable responses are produced neither by fully coherent motions nor by fully incoherent motions. Instead, special form of cross power spectral density function which depend on the system characteristic exist which produce these optimal responses. I mean this is uh, of some interest especially when we are talking about highest response as is uh, implied in the philosophy of response spectrum based methods. So, uh, the, the notion of this optimal cross PSD functions need to be interpreted in that context. Now, the second case is when uh, both the cross power spectral density nothing about it is known. So, both amplitude and phase are not uh, are unknowns. Then we can write uh, again we return to this expression and look at H3 of omega and we recast H3 of omega in this form. Uh, we collect terms uh, containing sine and cosine terms separately and define an amplitude and phase function associated with those terms. I can write H3 of omega in this form. So, the details of this uh, G1, G2 functions are shown here. Uh, you have to simply collect the terms uh, which multiply cos and sin separately and define G1 and G2. So, these are defined here. So, R of omega is square root G1 square plus G2 square, alpha is tan inverse G1 by G2. So, equipped with this, now we have the expression for the variance where H3 of omega is now written in this form. Now, Sxy of omega takes values between 0 and this quantity and cosine function takes values between minus 1 and plus 1. So, what we can do, what we are interested is, is in finding sigma g square which is maximum. So, what we will do is, we will set the amplitude of Sxy to its uh, highest value if cosine of this function is positive and that depends on relative value of phi xy and alpha and we will set it as uh, H3 of omega. Uh, Sxy we will put it as 0 if uh, this, this uh, cosine of this function is uh, uh, minus 1. That would happen when phi xy minus omega, uh, phi xy of omega minus alpha of omega is pi. So, this will produce the favorable uh, response, this will produce the uh, least favorable uh, response. So, this is uh, to be minimum as I was telling you have to set it to pi and we get this uh, answer. Again, we notice that uh, here the response is produced by fully coherent motions, but the phase spectrum depends upon frequency in a specific manner.
Now, before we leave this topic of special variability, uh, I would like to just briefly highlight uh, problems of special variation of support motion in secondary systems of uh, industrial structures. So, for example, as I was telling piping networks. For sake of discussion, let us consider a building in which there is a piping. This is a piping structure which is supported at two points on a primary system. So, this blue blue structure is the building and this structure suffers the support displacement x g of t. Due to this, the floats suffer the displacement u of t and v of t. If the mass of this piping structure is uh, relatively small with respect to the mass of this structure and under other certain considerations, we can assume that there is a kind of uncoupling that is possible where I will consider the piping structure separately and analyze its response for these floor displacements. So, again the point that, that is being made is that this structure now is multiply supported and subjected to differential support motions. Now, the definition of these support displacements uh, have to be arrived at carefully. For that, we may have to consider the possible dynamic interaction between the secondary, secondary system and the primary system. It is not that while finding u of t, v of t, we entirely ignore the presence of the secondary system. So, there lies uh, co certain complicating features. So, the characteristic features that we need to take into account is first one what is known as tuning. Here, the natural frequencies of P and S systems in their uncoupled system come close to each other and there is a significant dynamic interaction. That leads to feedback effect between the motions of the two systems. It can be present under resonant or even under uh, when tuning is not perfectly uh, present, still there can be a feedback. Now, the primary system in this particular example could be a civil structure made up of say uh, concrete, it could be a reinforced concrete structure, the piping is a metal structure. The energy dissipation characteristics between these two systems are quite uh, different from each other and uh, the assumption of classical damping model for this type of structures may not be admissible and one may have to deal with uh, non-classically damped systems in arriving at uh, motions u of t and v of t. So, so finally, there is a spatial coupling, the secondary system being multiply supported and subject to differential support motions. So, that means um, this piping system responds to the floor displacement at this level as well as at this level that induces certain special coupling in the system. Now, this problem is quite different from uh, the study of specially extended structures in uh, uh, you know, land based structures like bridges and um, large dams, where the support motions are essentially characterized by the phenomena associated with wave passage in the earth medium, whereas here the support motions that reach uh, the supporting points of the secondary system, uh, you know these excitation propagate through a man-made structure and they can be quite complex. It depends on the natural frequencies and more shapes of the structure uh, and it can be quite diverse. So, the modal combination rules that we derived based on arguments for land-based structures need to be carefully looked into before we can apply for this class of problems. I would not go into details of this, I leave it as a thought. Uh, uh, there is vast literature available on this. Uh, uh, I thought it is useful to mention this because we are talking about multiply supported structures. So, at this point we will conclude this lecture uh, and we will consider further applications of uh, random vibration analysis in the remaining lectures.